Marcy, it's probably about to press speed. It's probably in the bonus game with a lot of pressure at the time. Hi fellow RC explorers, my name is David and today I have a new product for you guys. This is the NACE32 built-in tricopter frame. Ooh. Ah. Here it is, the tricopter frame with the built-in NACE32 board. This has many advantages, like you don't have cables going everywhere. It's also lighter, it looks cleaner, it's protected in a crash. And also you don't have to have a stupid control board on the top, which means you have all kinds of room on the top of the frame. Together with the power distribution frame, there's hardly any wires going anywhere anymore. <clears throat> I really suck at this infomercial stuff. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to set up an ACE32 board for a tricopter using a special firmware that Stevie's wrote. Don't worry if the numbers in the setup video doesn't match the ones you get when you paste the settings from the website, because the settings on the website are always going to be the latest up to date, so use them. Before we get started, I want to thank Steven Amor for writing the special clean flight firmware for the tricopter. It vastly improves the tricopter tail performance. It is phenomenal. Thank you, Stevie. It is awesome. So let's get started. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is solder this 90 degree pin header to the board. So just plop it in, but then we want to add an angle upwards to clear the servo wires through the hole. So just push it back, get your soldering iron hot, and then solder one pin at each end of the board. This way you can heat it up later and get the perfect angle and it's gonna hold in place. Grab the board in your hands and then push using your thumb towards the back of the board while heating up the pins. This way you're going to get a good angle that's going to hold and then you just solder the rest of the pins. The row in the back is a little bit difficult to solder because they are all connected to the ground. The rest of the pins should be pretty straightforward though. Look at that, it looks pretty good. The optional power distribution board is available with the built-in 5V BEC that's designed to power this NACE32 board. It also powers the receiver and the servo at the same time. But remember, if your speed controllers have a built-in BEC, you have to remove the positive pin from the servo connector. And the easiest way to do this is either to cut it, that's a little too permanent a solution for me. So I usually lift the pin, pull it out, and put some heat shrink over it, and then fold it back. And that's really easy. Next, we're going to plug in the speed controllers. The board is marked with an L, R, B, and S, which stands for left, right, back, and servo. That is looking at the tricopter from the back and from above. Also, while we're at it, this is the direction I recommend you have your props turning. Also make sure that the signal wire is connected to the signal pin, which is the bottommost one on the board. Then it's just a matter of plugging in the right connected to the right pin. And then we're going to plug in the receiver. This step is pretty straightforward. All you have to do is just plug in channel 1 to channel 1, channel 2 to channel 2, and so on. Even if you're using a Spectrum receiver, Hi-Tech receiver, Futaba receiver, or JR receiver, you can remap the pins in the software later, so don't worry about it. By the way, I recommend using at least 6 channels for this. You can save some cables by plugging in the first channel as normal, but then flipping over the other cables on the side and plugging it into the signal ports on the receiver and then the signal pins on the NACE board. But if your receiver has a PPM output, you only need one wire. You can just plug it into channel 1 and you're going to be good to go. Before we go any further, remove the props. Whenever you do setup on the board, remove your props, otherwise you're going to have a flying blender in your face at some point. Also, do not plug in the main power. The board isn't set up yet and things could freak out. To set up the board, you need a micro USB cable, which is not included. It plugs in on the side here, but wait, don't do it yet. We need to do some setup on the computer first. So let's move over there. Open your browser and head over to rcexplorer.se. Then click on the shop, then on the NACE32 frame. Now scroll down and click on the pre-configured Clean Flight Setup tab. Now click on the link named USB to URT driver. Now locate and download the driver that's correct for your system. I'm running a Mac, so I'm gonna download that and install it. This is a very standard driver and it should be easy to install on any operating system. You might need to restart your computer after the install is complete. Head back to the product page and now if you don't have it, install Google Chrome. I already have it, so next step is to install the Clean Flight Configurator. Just click Add to Chrome and then Confirm. The app is now available in the Chrome App Launcher and we can now start it. But before we do anything here, we're going to head back to the product page. We're going to download the very special Tricopter firmware that Stevie's wrote and unzip that. 
This firmware greatly improves the yaw performance on tricopters because it handles the servos so much better. We hope that some of these features will be implemented into the stock CleanFlight setup later, but at this point you have to download the special firmware from this site. Now it's finally time to connect the board. Only plug in the USB cable though, do not plug in the flight battery yet, we still have some settings to do before that. In the top left corner of CleanFlight there's a drop down menu where you can select the COM port. This is going to look different depending on the operating system you're running. Select the COM port that the board is plugged into. Now head over to the firmware flasher tab and click on the load firmware locally button. Browse to where you unzipped the special firmware earlier and select the hex file. Now click the flash firmware button. It should sit flashing and the bar at the top should be moving. If it doesn't, you probably selected the wrong COM port or the driver is not working properly. Now we can connect to the board. Just hit connect at the top. Don't worry if the 3D model is upside down, we're going to fix that later. Now we're going to go over to the CLI tab and we're going to copy some settings from the website. So copy everything below the brake and paste that into the CLI window. And then you're going to hit return on your keyboard. On the bottom here it's going to say you're rebooting and then you can click on the setup tab. It might take a couple of seconds because the board might still be rebooting, but once it's done you can head over to the configuration tab. Normally you wouldn't change this setting unless you're running a PPM sum receiver. There's a ton of different settings you can do here, but I'm only going to talk about the motor stop function. I highly recommend disabling this so the motors will spin when the board is armed. This is a great safety feature as you will immediately know if your copter is armed because the props are spinning. Also it will keep the props from stopping in mid-air while doing really heavy aerobatics. If you made any changes, don't forget to scroll down and click save and reboot. The log on the top will tell you when the board is rebooted. Now head over to the receiver tab. Click on the channel map to select the receiver layout that matches the receiver you're using. The spectrum layout is throttle, aileron, elevator, rudder to input 1, 2, 3 and 4. Whereas Futaba has aileron, elevator, throttle, rudder. So select the one that matches your receiver and click save. Now it's time to set up the radio. So we're going to start off by making a new model memory. This is so there's no hidden sub trims or anything. A fresh start is always the best. I'm just going to set this up as a basic acro model with no extra features. Time to plug in the main flight battery so the receiver is powered up. The bars on the top should now display the live receiver values. So now we can test if the sticks move in the right direction. Moving the aileron stick to the right should increase the roll value and moving it to the left should decrease the value. Moving the elevator stick forward should increase the pitch value. Moving it backward should decrease it. Moving the yaw stick to the right should increase the value and moving it to the left should decrease the value. And finally moving the throttle stick upward should increase the throttle value. If something moves in the wrong direction you need to go into your transmitter's reverse menu and reverse that channel. Now we're going to make sure that the center of the stick equals 1500 milliseconds. Go to the sub trim menu on the transmitter and then increase or decrease the value until it says 1500 milliseconds on the computer or as close as you can get it. Then go into the endpoint adjustment and then move the stick all the way over to one corner and increase it until it says 2000 milliseconds or 1000 in the opposite direction. This way you get the best resolution possible and the best performance out of the board. Now repeat this for all the other channels as well. Different transmitters work differently when it comes to endpoint adjustment and sub trim, so you might have to do some trial and error to get this perfectly right. But since you only have to do this once, it's definitely worth the time. These are the values I ended up with. Next we're going to assign some switches. I recommend setting up channel 5 as a 2 position switch and channel 6 as a 3 position switch. We're going to use these switches to arm the board and also select the flight mode. So make sure that they work after you're done. Then click on the mode tab. We're going to add a range for the arm function. Make sure it's aux1 and flip channel 5 to the on position. The yellow little dot should move over and then you just drag the sliders over so that the yellow area is above the yellow dot. As long as the yellow dot is within the yellow area, the board will be armed. Don't forget to hit save. Now we're going to add a range for the auto level. Select aux2 on the drop down menu so channel 6 is controlling this feature. I want the auto level to be on while the switch is in the middle position, so this range is already good. Now we're going to add the horizon flight mode and that's going to be controlled by channel 6 as well, so select AUX2. I want this to be activated while the switch is in the top position, so I'm going to drag the range over to the right. Make sure that the two ranges don't overlap, always have some separations between the two. Now when the switch is at the bottom it's going to be in acro mode, in the middle it's going to be auto level, and at the top it's going to be in horizon. 
Don't forget to hit save after you're done with this. Now go back to the receiver menu. Take a look at the input values. Depending on the transmitter or receiver you're using, these numbers might jump up and down more than they are here. Also flick the stick back and forth to see if it stops on the same number. Depending on the play in your sticks and the potentiometers inside of your transmitter, this number might not always stop at the same point. So look for the highest number displayed and the lowest number displayed during these jumps. Now we're going to tell the board to ignore these jumps and only listen for proper transmitter input. Go to the CLI tab and type in get deadband and hit return. These two are the ones we're interested in, the deadband and the yaw deadband. Let's say the highest number you observed earlier was 1507 and 1493. This would give you a span of 7 in each direction. In this case I would set the deadband to 10 just to have some wiggle room. And you can do this by just typing in set deadband equal 10 and then hit return. We'll do the same with the yaw deadband. And the reason why there's two different ones is because sometimes you want more deadband on the yaw because when you move the throttle stick you might nudge the rudder. But I'm just going to set this to 10 as well. Just type in yaw underline deadband equal 10 and hit return. I'm just going to double check that the settings were made by typing get deadband. That looks good. Don't forget to type in save and hit enter otherwise you're going to lose all the settings you just made. Now we're going to do the throttle calibration. So unplug the flight battery and then head over to the motor tab. If you still haven't removed your prop, this is the time to do so because this is dangerous with props on. Now you're going to activate the motor tester by clicking the checkbox. Then drag the master slider all the way to the top. Now plug in the flight battery and wait for these tones. Now quickly pull the master slider all the way down. You should hear these tones. That means that the throttle calibration is now complete. Now disable the motor tester and head over to the servo tab. We're going to set up the servo next. If you look at the tilt mechanism from the back, this is the way the servo should move when you move the stick. And this is the way the servo should compensate when you move the copter left and right. If the servo moves in the wrong direction, you can change the direction in this drop down menu. You might also need to reverse the yaw channel on your transmitter. Hit save and double check that the servo is now moving in the opposite direction. Now it's very important that the servo doesn't bind when it's at the extremes. So to test that, move the rudder stick all the way over to one side. The servo should not hit the tilt mechanism in any way at the full extreme. If it does, you can reduce the travel here in the software. Increasing the min number will mean that the servo moves less in that direction, and decreasing the max number will mean that it moves less in the opposite direction. Don't forget to save. We have one more servo setup to do, but first we need to get in the air. So head over to the setup tab and put your copter on a flat, level and stable surface. Then click on calibrate accelerometer. Be sure that the copter is completely stationary while doing this. Now we can check that the 3D rendering is moving in the right direction. If it doesn't, do not fly your copter. Something is seriously wrong. You can now go out and test fly your copter, but don't fly like a maniac yet because we still have one more setting to do. To get the best possible performance out of the tail, we need to find where the servo is working the least during a hover. To plug the board into the computer again and head over to the PID tuning tab. Here you're going to remove the I term and the D term for the yaw. Write down the original values though before you delete them. Click save and then it's time to go out and fly again. Be ready for the yaw to drift like crazy on this flight. And what you're going to do is try to compensate that with trim. As you can see it's drifting quite a lot and I'm holding the stick just to compensate. Now I'm going to release the stick and try to add some clicker trims. Be ready to catch it again because it's going to drift while you're doing this. And then repeat that until it stops drifting. Almost there. Just another few clicks and we're done. And it seems to be holding really good. If you find that you have to use an unreasonable amount of trim, you might need to move the tilt mechanism on the servo spline. Okay, time to land and plug the board into the computer again. I recommend doing this trim flight on a calm day so you don't have to deal with the wind. Once connected, head over to the receiver tab. Now take a look at the yaw input. The number of milliseconds this is off from 1500 is how many milliseconds we should add to the servo output. In my case it was around 53 milliseconds off, so I'm going to add that to the midpoint of the servo. If you had to reverse your yaw earlier, you might need to subtract this number instead of adding it. Now click save and remove the trim from your transmitter again. This method of finding the hover center for the servo might not work if your dead band is set way too high. Another option is just doing this by trial and error in the servo menu. Now we're going to head back to the PID tuning tab and then restore the I and D value. And finally, you're going to click save and you're done. You're ready to go out and fly your new NACE32 powered tricopter. 
Thank you for watching this video and buying my stuff. It's thanks to you that I can do what I do, so thank you. And as my friend Noptop says, we'll make something. I'll see you next time.